Hello, I'm Randy Seaver. I'm bringing you the first episode in our little study called Burning Straw Dummies. This uh, series, the title for this series, came from a statement made by Charles Spurgeon when he was dealing with some of these same issues uh, back in the 1800s. Mr. Spurgeon said, What a wonderful deal has been done by some men in burning figures of their own stuffing. How earnestly do they set themselves to confute, we would say refute, what no man defends. How earnestly do they set themselves to refute what no man defends. As I've viewed a number of videos on the internet, as I've uh, read various articles, it has become quite clear to me that most people are arguing against a doctrine that no one truly believes. We hear things like, uh, I don't believe in total depravity because I believe the Bible teaches all men are responsible to repent and believe. I believe all men are responsible and therefore men can't be totally depraved, totally unable to come because God would clearly not ask people to do something they're incapable of doing. And yet the scripture teaches us quite clearly that God requires us to obey his law. Uh, this is incumbent upon us. And yet Paul tells us that the natural man, the man, man in the flesh, is hostile toward God, for he is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can he be. Yet that is, neither indeed is he able to be. And so God holds us responsible to do something that we're not able to do. Um, secondly, someone will say, well, I, I don't believe in the doctrine of total depravity because, because I believe every single person has a will. And Calvinists teach that sinners don't have a will. And you'll hear this uh, regularly as you listen to some of these videos. And so the question is, is, is this really what Calvinists believe? Do Calvinists believe that men are robots, uh, puppets, automa automatons, and that God is uh, the, the grand programmer or the grand pr puppet master, and he's up in the, in the sky, and he's, uh, he's just orchestrating all this stuff. And we, we never choose what we want. Uh, we, we simply are uh, dragged kick kicking and screaming e either into heaven or into hell, uh, because we don't really have a will. And you'll hear this. You'll hear this regularly. These Calvinists believe that God just zaps people and, uh, and he makes them go to heaven even if they don't want to go. And of course that's just laughable. It would be laughable if it weren't so ridiculous. This is, this is clearly not what we believe. Thirdly, people will say that, that I don't believe in in total depravity because I don't believe every person acts as sinfully as he's capable of acting. I believe there are people that do really nice things. And again, you'll hear this quite regularly. Total depravity can't be right because people do nice things to other people. Uh, people act morally. Not every man beats his wife. Not every, not every person abuses his or her children. Not every person is a rapist. Not every person is a child molester. And so, so because people are able to act morally, uprightly, uh, outwardly uh, obeying the law, paying their taxes, obeying the, the law enforcement officer, etc., total depravity can't be true. And, of course, this, this simply is not something we would argue against. Of course, people can act morally. There are some really, really nice people in the world because of the common grace of God that, that enables them to, to, to be nice to other people and to, to be kind and to build hospitals and, and orphanages and, and start programs to get people off of drugs and alcohol. And there are all sorts of nice things that people do, but, but the problem is this simply is not the issue. Even wicked people perform acts that are good and acceptable in the sight of other people. That simply simply isn't the issue. So we need to we need to make sure that people understand what we are not saying when we talk about total depravity. First of all, we don't mean 
that sinners have no ability to reason. We, have, we don't mean that people have no ability mentally to understand the terms of the gospel. We don't mean that people have no ability to reason that, that if there is a creation, if there is order in that creation, if there is design in that creation, then there must have been someone who ordered that creation, who designed that creation, and who made that creation. People are able to reason that. And Paul says it's on that very basis that people are responsible before God and without excuse or a, without a reasoned defense as they stand before that God in judgment. Paul says this, The invisible things of him, of God, since the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things or from the things that are made, that is the creation, even his eternal power and deity, in order that they may be without excuse. And so people are held responsible because we can understand, we can reason, we can deduce that if there is a creation, there must have been a creator. Secondly, we do not mean that sinners cannot feel a deep need to worship a higher power. The Apostle Paul really tells us that people are incurably religious. He tells us that people really want to worship something. Because he tells us again in Romans chapter 1 that, that uh, people have exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for images made like unto man and birds and four-footed beast and creeping things. Instead of worshiping God, they have worshiped and served the creation or the creature rather than the creator. And so people really have a need to worship and people enjoy um, a, a worship experience. The problem is that people don't have a desire to worship God as he has revealed himself in the scriptures. We don't mean, when we talk about total depravity, that sinners cannot know and feel a sense of impending judgment. The Apostle Paul, in fact, again in Romans chapter 1, says this, who knowing the decree of God, the judgment of God, that those who do such things, who practice such things, are worthy of death, not only do those things, but have pleasure in others who do them. They know that judgment is coming. I don't have to argue with people and convince them that, that God is going to judge them. People know that in their heart of hearts. Otherwise, people would feel no sense of guilt, even those who deny that that God is, and even those who deny that, that God has prescribed for us in his word how we ought to act, what he requires of us, and all the rest, they have denied that, and yet people instinctively have a sense of guilt. People know right from wrong. Paul tells us that, that uh, sinners have a conscience. We're able to say to other people, you shouldn't have done that. How, how do we know they shouldn't have done that? And the answer is because we know what's right. We know what's wrong. There have been um, codes of natural law written for people in pagan societies that are very much like the law of God. How do people know that? And the answer is because the law of God at creation was written in our hearts. And we have that, that God consciousness, that consciousness of, of what God requires. We know. And so when we talk about total depravity, we, we don't mean that sinners don't know what God requires. Of course we do. We don't, we don't mean that sinners are incapable of acting morally. The Apostle Paul says, as touching the law, as a Pharisee, he was blameless. That is, no one could say, Paul, you have, a, you have disobeyed, outwardly disobeyed, God's moral code. No, Paul was able to say, I, I, I kept all these things from my youth. The man, possibly the Apostle Paul himself, the rich young ruler who came to Jesus and, 
and said to him, Good master, what must I do that I might inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Keep the commandments. You know them. This young man said, I've kept all of these from my youth. And, and sinners outside of Christ can do that. They can say that and say it rightly. And so we're not saying that sinners are incapable of, of, um, of being moral, upright people. Of course, that's not what we're saying at all. We're not saying that people can't feel religious. There are many people that go into evangelistic services and they hear the lounge music that has been orchestrated to prepare them for hearing the message and, and um, they, they just kind of sense and feel that the Spirit is in that place. And the reality is they're not feeling that at all. They're feeling a false sense of emotion that has been created just for them so that, so that they can be prepared for that, uh, that ultimate and final end of the reason for the meeting, and that is to get them down the aisle, to sign the card, to pray the prayer, to uh, make some sort of confession. And they're not even aware, but they're feeling religious. They might go into a Roman Catholic cathedral and, and see the beautiful stained glass and the, the, the magnificent architecture and, and the statuary and, and feel a sense of, 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 uh, of religion. They feel so close to God. They hear the liturgy and uh, they're impressed by it. They might hear a beautiful anthem and, uh, and, and just feel a deep, deep religious feeling. We're not suggesting that people aren't able to feel religious. We're not suggesting that people aren't able to go into a, an evangelical church and, and at the end of the meeting walk down the aisle and, and uh, pray a prayer and, and sign a card, even get baptized. Of course people are able to do that. What we're saying is that that is not necessarily a conversion experience. They're not necessarily exercising faith. Um, but sinners are able to feel religious. They're able to, to uh, want to go to heaven when they die, especially if they think of heaven as the big rock, rock candy mountain where all their sensual desires are going to be satisfied and they can escape the fires of hell. Of course, sinners are able to do all of that. We're not saying they can't. Here's what we're saying, and I want to deal with this next time um, in, in more detail. What we're saying is that sinners are unable to love God for his own sake as he has commanded. Sinners are able to seek his glory as their chief purpose and greatest delight. And sinners are able to order every facet of their lives, including their quest for divine acceptance, according to God's will as it has been revealed in the scriptures. This sinners cannot do. We cannot love God for himself as he has revealed himself. We cannot seek his glory as our highest, as, as our chief purpose and greatest delight. And we cannot order every facet of our lives according to his revealed will so that we are pleasing to him. We're going to talk about that a bit in our next episode. Until then, I'm Randy Seaver. I hope you have a blessed day.